Welcome to IC Medan. We are so happy you're tuning in with us online. My name is Gary. And I'm Josh. And we're part of the team here. We are so thankful that you're here. Give someone a shout out and lighten up the chat room. Thank you for joining us. We want to thank you for your faithful giving. And because of your generosity, we have continued to be a blessing in our community. Even in this time of crisis, we continue to support our mission and minister to hundreds of people every single week. And today, if you would like to continue giving, you can give via online transfer, you can scan our QR code, all the giving information is available at icmedan.com slash giving. Let's keep make a difference and keep being the church. Hey parents, we are excited to announce that now we have IC Kids Weekend Show every Saturday at 3 p.m on Instagram Live. Our IC Kids teacher will connect with your kids and they will have a fun activity that you and your kids can enjoy watching together. Don't forget to check that out. Now let's lean in, take some notes, eliminate all distraction, and let's take some time to worship. Hi, we wanna welcome all of you guys joining today, man. We are so excited to be able to worship with you. I just wanna encourage you before we start, let's just take some, the next few moments to just remove all distractions wherever you are in your home, in your living room, in your bedroom, just remove all distractions and let's just focus our heart and our worship on Jesus today. I believe we've been praying for you and we believe that God wants to touch you today. So let's worship the Lord together. tried so hard to see it Took me so long to believe it That you chose someone like me To carry your victory Perfection could never earn it You give what we don't deserve And you take the broken thing and raise them to glory You are my champion Giants fall when you stand undefeated Every battle you've won I am who you say I am You crown me with confidence I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all now i can finally see it you're teaching me how to receive it so let all the striving see this is my victory Now I can finally see it You're teaching me how to receive it So let all the striving see Come on, we sing Yeah, this is my victory You are my champion Giants for when you Every battle you've won I am who you say I am You crown me with confidence I am seated In the heavenly place I'm defeated With the one who has conquered it all Come on, church, let's declare this together. Come on. When I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down. I have the authority. Jesus has given me. When I open up my mouth, Miracles start breaking out 
I have the authority. Jesus has given me. Come on, we say. When I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down. I have the authority. Jesus has given me. When I open up my mouth, miracles start breaking out. I have the authority. Jesus, you are my champion. Giants fall when you stay undefeated. Every battle you've won, I am. I am who you say I am. You crown me with. Giants fall when you stand undefeated Every battle you've won I am who you say I am You crown me with confidence I am seated in the heavenly place Undefeated with the one who has conquered it all You know, we can believe that, that God is our champion. In every battle, He's won. Man, isn't that something to, to just worship Him about, that He fights every battle for us. You know, we're gonna sing a new song today. It's a powerful song, and I really believe that the Lord is gonna speak to you and touch you and this morning. But the, the, the song is called King of Glory. And in the book of Psalms, it says, who is the King of Glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. And that's what I want us to be reminded of today is that God is fighting our battles no matter what things we're facing. You know, in these times that are uncertain, the only thing that is certain and the only thing that is solid is, is our God and He's fighting for you. So it says, the, you know, King of glory, fill this place. I just wanna be with you. We're about to sing that, and that's what I pray. Like, let that be the prayer of your heart. Let's sink, seek his face and seek the King of glory together. Let's worship. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. And every man will bow down and say you are king so let's start right now why would we wait king of glory fill this place i just want to be with you just want to be with you. King of glory, fill this place. Just want to be with you. I just want to be with you. Come on, let's sing. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are king. So let's start right now. Why would we wait? We can praise you now in victory.
declare this. So we'll sing hallelujah until you come again. And we'll dance in your presence until you come again. I'll just sing hallelujah until you come again. And I'll dance in your presence until you come again. And we'll sing hallelujah until you come again. And we'll dance in your presence. healing. God, you're a king of joy. God, you're a king of peace. God, Lord, we praise you that your presence, I believe, God is coming back. God, I pray, Lord, for your church, Lord. God, that when the ones that we've become lethargic, Lord, and tired and downtrodden, but God, I believe that God, a breakthrough is coming. That God, you are speaking, Lord. God, you're feeling every house and every heart again. God, you are still the God on the throne. And God, I thank you, Father, that Lord, you are at work, Lord, in every one of us, Father. You have not forgotten us. You are here with us. And so, Father, we give you this service. And I pray that, God, speak to our hearts, King of glory. God, fill our hearts. Lord, speak to us through this word, through our pastor today, Lord. God, I know that, Lord, you place a, a word in his heart just for us. And so, God, we receive it right now. And, God, I pray a special blessing on our church, Lord. God, though we may be separated physically, God, we are connected spiritually, Lord. And God, I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for this church, and I thank you for this service and for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you guys, and have an awesome service. Enjoy the message. Goodbye. Take a sad song and make it better. Remember to let her under your skin. Then you begin to make it better. better.
I, I still love that intro. I could watch that every, I mean, I, lo, I, I've been watching it a lot, actually. I just like just watching it for the fun of it, seeing the Beatles in cartoon form. And uh, plus the song is just cool. Welcome to our online service, Church at Home, and uh, week number two of this new series, Hey Jude, A Survivor's Guide. And uh, man, this is all about, Jude is writing about how we can survive in changing times and when, when there is a threat of change and when there's a falling away of faith. And so he gets into a lot of this. And I was thinking there's, a, there's change happening all the time. I mean, in this life, change is constant. Change can come quick. I mean, when we think even about when this season of, of Diruma Aja and pandemic and all of that, that happened so fast. Yeah. I mean, we saw it going on in different places, but then suddenly, boom, it's here and, and we're going online and, and things change for everyone at home and change for, for all of us. Change can be so sudden, things can shift and there can be changes from generation to generation. I mean, we see this in fashion. You know, we're, we're all fashionable people here, right? And we're dressed different than people did the last decade or the decade before, I was thinking back to the 1980s when I grew up. I remember when my mom went shopping and she got me mesh t-shirts. Do you guys know mesh is like, it's like thousands of little holes, you know? Could you, mesh t-shirts. And I had like parachute pants, like Michael Jackson pants, mesh t-shirts with all these holes. And then like a, a shirt that you wear over that. You don't see a lot of mesh shirts. Any, anyone here own a mesh t-shirt? You don't see mesh shirts. Praise Jesus, you don't see mesh. <laughs> They're not pretty. But fashions change. Hairstyles, the rat tail was really popular in the 80s. I mean, if you've seen that, it's literally like a guy has a, yeah. it looks like a rat tail. <laughs> or, or mullets. You know, the, the business in the front, party in the back. <laughs> That's what, in the 80s, I think I was in third or fourth grade, maybe fifth grade, me and some of my friends formed a band. I named the, bland, the band Dagger in the Heart. I mean, I had a cool name. Here we go, we've got Dagger in the Heart, and we had no instruments, no skills, no gigs, but we had a drawing, I drew a logo of the dagger in the heart, and it was a heart with a dagger in it. <laughs> and me and my friend Brad would write songs. So we had some songs we were writing. We were heavily influenced by Bon Jovi, which was one of my, our favorites at the time. And I remember Brad had the coolest mullet. I mean, on top, it was short spikes. I, you've never heard cool and mullet in the same sentence short spikes on top, I mean spiked up, and then so to the shoulders in the back. I thought Brad was the coolest, but you don't see mullets around much anymore. And then words change. I mean, I remember when, when bad meant bad, you know, and then bad meant cool. You guys know, I like, words just change. Things can change generation from generation. Then bad is cool, then sick is cool. But it's not cool to be sick right now. But, yeah, yeah. but then sick is cool. Wow, that's so sick. And then oh. lit can mean cool. Yeah. I remember when we were having a conversation, some of us here were making church t-shirts with lit on it. Yeah. And when I was younger, lit just meant that someone had gotten drunk that weekend. <laughs> if someone said, wow, I was so lit this weekend, you're like, oh my gosh, dude, you're better than that. And uh, then we're putting lit on church t-shirts. <laughs> I really had to change my view of what is the meaning of the words. Things change. Thongs. That's dangerous, guys. So, I mean, thongs has different meanings. This is a dangerous one that I looked up in the commus this week just so I could see, okay, what information is out there for thongs? Sandal. And that's right. I mean, Many people for years, they've called the thongs, the sandal, or the flip-flops. It's also a style of underwear. Yeah. And I was just thinking Saturday, the postman came to my house. He was bringing mail. He had a surat for me. I went to the door, slipped on some thongs, and walked outside. <laughs> 
Now, depending on how you yeah. define that, yeah. <laughs> that's a dangerous story to tell people. I mean, either, you know, I'm, I mean, the, you have a very, very surprised mailman. You could just put it that way. Yeah. So things change so much. And then music. I mean, we just had uh, some of the staff over. Some of you guys were even over. We had, uh, we had a game night, just kind of hanging out. And, and I was playing a playlist of 80s love songs. I mean, if anyone at home, if you don't have a playlist of 80s love songs, do yourself a favor and put that on your Spotify because <laughs> it's so nice. But we had the conversation about how much music has changed. And in my opinion, how much better music was. And we can have different opinions, but we can all agree that things change. And it, they change quickly from generation to generation. Some things for the better. No one is missing mesh, shirt, mesh shirts or rat tails. Yeah. Some things for the worst, if you think music used to be better. Some things are a mix. I mean, we have Wi-Fi, all the information at our fingertips, even on our phones, everything you want to know. I mean, when I was a kid, my grandparents had a set of encyclopedias, A through Z. If you wanted to know something, you had to know how to spell it, and then, okay, this starts with a B. If it was not in the B encyclopedia, there's no way to know. It's a history. It's a mystery. <laughs> one of history's mysteries. <laughs> Wait, this isn't in the B encyclopedia. That's because no one knows. But now you can look up anything. It's right there. So positive is you have access to everything. Yeah. Yeah. Negative is you have access to everything. Yeah. So things change from generation to generation. And, and in a world where things change and change quickly, Jude is giving a warning to the church. And he's saying there is one thing that does not change, cannot change, and we have to fight to make sure that it doesn't change, and that is the truth. Jude is talking about the truth, which we can also refer to as the gospel, as our faith, which is how he refers to it in the scriptures. He's saying that the faith can't change. We have to fight for our faith. So this is week number two of, of this series, Hey Jude, we're going to take four weeks and look through this book. Jude was written around the mid-60s AD, which is very interesting because it almost correlates with Hey Jude coming out in the 60s, and then, but the way different time, 1900 years difference. Jude was a brother of Jesus. Jesus had four brothers. Uh, they were the four brothers that they were the sons of Joseph and Mary and Jude is one of them. The brothers were James, Joseph, Jude, or a.k.a. Judas, or we may say Judas, or Judah, and then Simon. So Jude is writing about a threat. If God's people don't do something, something is going to change, and not just change, something could be lost forever. Something valuable, not just, not just fashion, or not just the change in in music or styles, but, but false teachings were threatening the very foundation of the church. So Jude says in, in verses 3 through 4, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith. So we're going to look at that again in a moment, but but contending means to fight for. And we're going to look at that word. He's saying, I was, I was compelled. I had to do this. I had to write to urge you to contend for the faith that was given to us once and for all. So here's this faith that once and for all was entrusted, it says. Given into our hands, God trusted us. Entrusted to God's holy people. And verse 4, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago, have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only so, uh, sovereign and Lord. So that's verses three through four. So some people had slipped into the church. Jude's giving this warning. Some people have slipped in. They have their own agendas. They have their own destructive thoughts and ideas and opinions they, they are people who come in and they, they poison the church to gain for themselves. They, they don't fear God. They don't even know God. 
They refuse to be under the authority that God has set up. They refuse to be under structure, and instead they seek to elevate themselves. They try to gain a following by speaking falsely about the church, falsely about leaders, falsely about uh, other pastors, to speak falsely even about God himself. They have this whole different idea, this whole different view, and, and they try to share it, and they try to speak with such boldness and authority so that even they could lead astray the disciples or the followers of Jesus. Peter also warned in his letters, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, he says, but there were false prophets too in those days, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly tell their lies about God, turning against even their master who bought them. But theirs will be a swift and terrible end. Many will follow their evil teaching that there is nothing wrong with sexual sin. And because of them, Christ and his way will be scoffed at, which is mocked or laughed at. So because of the way they live, claiming that they are Christians, claiming they follow Jesus, but, but living with this license for immorality, People will even laugh at Jesus. They'll scoff at Christianity. It says in verse 3, These teachers in their greed will tell you anything to get hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago and their destruction is on the way. So we have a warning from Jude and around the same time, Peter is giving this same warning to the church. Hey, we've known this is coming. We've known that there's going to be false teachers. We've known there's going to be an attack on our faith. Even Paul called them vicious wolves. Vicious wolves that come in in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 30. He says, I know full well that after I leave you, false teachers like vicious wolves will, will appear among you, not sparing the flock. Some of you yourselves will distort the truth in order to draw a following. And then in 31a, he says, watch out. That's the warning. I mean, that's what you say to people when you're warning them. Watch out. Watch out. Be watchful. There's something coming. We're hearing this. All of these men of God that, that we look to as examples and, and leaders of the faith in the New Testament, they're constantly warning, look out, watch out, be ready, be prepared for this. There's going to be people who will come that will try to build their own kingdom, not God's kingdom. They're in it for themselves. There's going to be people who come and they will try to convince you to follow them by speaking negatively about other people. Hey, I'm pulling you aside and whispering about this or that. Even Jesus himself gives us a warning in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 18. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly, they are ferocious wolves. Even Jesus is saying, there are wolves that will come into the flock and they will, they will try to blend in with the rest of you. They'll try to be like they're, they're one of my followers. And he says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So watching fruit is very important. He says, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So he's saying, hey, be careful from what tree you pick a teacher or a leader or a pastor. Be careful what tree. What does a tree look like? What are you wanting to pick? Who do you want to follow? Who do you want to learn from? Who, who do you think has something they can teach you? Look at the tree. Because you can see from the tree, you can see what's growing there. You can see what fruit is available. If the tree doesn't look healthy, don't eat the fruit, yeah. right? I mean, that's good advice for all of us. If, if it doesn't look healthy, there's, there's, there's wolves in sheep's clothing, people, people among us who are not one of us. And it's always been like this. The unity of the church and the sanctity of our faith is always under attack, even from the very first century when Jesus formed the church. It's always been under attack. Satan never rests. He's never sleeping. He's always on the attack. He's always trying to stop the mission of the church ever since the beginning. So who defends the unity? And who fights for the faith? We do. We're the ones that fight. He 
It says, Dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to urge, to write and urge you to contend for the faith. I wanted to write about other things, but I have to write you to fight. You got to fight for the faith. He uses this word contend, which is fight or stand, resist, maintain, hold on to, declare, claim. Uh, the word contend implies a, a stretching. Like with stretching, you're contending for something. You're reaching for something. You're stretching out of your comfort zone. You're stretching as with purpose to win something. Jude was saying that we've got to stretch. We've got to contend in order to not lose everything that was built. You got to fight. You have to resist false teaching. You have to stand on the truth. You have to hold on to the faith. It requires stretching, meaning it may not always be comfortable, but it will always be profitable. You know, when you stretch, it's not always comfortable at first, but after you stretch and you're, you're more limber, you're, you're more athletic, you're ready to do, you're ready to fight. It's with some stretching. In verse four, like we said, he continues and he he describes these people. He describes what they're going to look like. They're ungodly. They pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality, and they deny Jesus. Jude is making a clear distinction or difference between the contenders and the pretenders. So he's saying there's a difference between the fighters and the fakers. There's a difference between the faithful and and the phony, there's a difference in those who seek first the kingdom of God and those who seek first the kingdom of me. And Jude is calling to the church then, just like it is the same for us today, the calling is, will the real Christians please stand up? I mean, that's the call. Will the real Christians please stand up? That's what Jude is saying. Will you stand up and fight? Are you, are you one of us? Will you stand up and, and contend for the faith? Will you hold on to the truth or will you fall away? There, there was a great falling away and there were false teachers that they had fallen away from the faith and fallen away from the truth. So they're trying to get other people, hey, come with me, come with me. And Jude didn't even want to write about this. I was saying earlier, man, it you know you're going to be studying a, a, a difficult book when the author says, I didn't even want to write about this. You know, I wanted to just write about the fun stuff. I just wanted to write about salvation. He just wanted to write a letter that when people read it, they jump for joy and say, hallelujah. You know, all of us love that with church too. But he's saying, I, I was compelled. The Holy Spirit compelled him. Hey, stop what you're doing. This is more important. I need you to give a warning. Just like I believe the Holy Spirit led us to this book in this season. We've been going somewhere as a church, and, and I knew right in this season is when it was time to go through the book of Jude. I hadn't even read back through it yet at the time. I just knew we're doing the general epistles. And then when I read through it, I was like, wow, this is exactly right for this time. We're in a difficult season. There's a lot of change. There, there's people falling away. There's people who are tired. There's people who are hurting. And, and in the midst of this, we need this, this wake-up call that Jude is giving, saying, will the real Christians please stand up? Will you fight? So he changed his message. And even though he didn't want to talk about this, it was a, a message that the church needs, a warning that we need, something that needs to be preached to the church that just because someone sits next to you doesn't mean that they stand with you. Those are hard things to hear. Those are hard things. But just because someone sits next to you doesn't mean they stand with you. He's saying, watch out, watch the fruit. Check the tree, look at their life. I don't mean in a, a judgy kind of way, but Jesus himself was clear that we should be picky about whose words we receive. Jesus was telling us, be picky. Don't receive words from everyone. It's just like if we're picking fruit. We look for good fruit. Pastor Kerry and I have a, a certain place that we order fruit from. Why? Because the fruit is good. That's normally what we do for fruit, right? And the fruit from this place is hand-picked. They pick it by hand. They pick 
the good pieces of fruit. They pick the best. They look at it and see what, what is the healthiest. What is it they want? Hey, we want this and we want that. Here's where the good one is. And they pick it and they give it to us. I choose mentors in the same way. I look at the fruit. How healthy is the tree? What does the fruit look like? Okay, I want you to mentor me. Oh, here's a pastor I'm going to listen to. I, I pick in the same way. I want something healthy. I want something good. I want something that's going to be beneficial. And some of us, some of you may not be so picky in who you're listening to or who you're getting advice from. Some of you get advice from people whose lives are more messed up than yours. <laughs> I've counseled with people like that. I've talked to someone recently and told them, you're a stronger leader than that person. If you're around them, you lead. Yeah. Don't be led. Yeah. It's some of you are, some of you guys are getting dating advice from another guy you've never seen with a girl. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. How many people at home you do that? Yeah. Someone's giving you all, here's, here's all the advice for your love life. You know, I've never seen you. If you stop for a minute, I've never seen you talk to a girl. <laughs> Look at the fruit. Look at the tree. What, what is it that you want? How can someone give you directions to a place that, that, that they've never been? Yeah, yeah, that's true. How can you get directions from someone who hasn't been where you're going? They don't even know how to get there. Worse, maybe they're going in the wrong direction themselves. Jesus was saying, be picky. He gives us permission. Be picky. Look at the fruit. We're not, we don't judge people. Oh, oh, this person's like this, this person's like that. But you have to judge who you're going to receive words from who you're going to accept advice from. You've got to look for the right people. The difference between the contenders and pretenders. Here's what Jude, Peter, Paul, Jesus, this is what they are all telling us, that the, you'll know the pretenders by their fruit. You'll know the false teachers by their fruit, by their character, by their actions. Jude described these to look out for. The first one is they are ungodly. They're ungodly. One definition of ungodly means without worship. So to be ungodly means you've got no one above you. I'm the authority of my life. That's ungodly. It's without worship. You're not worshiping anyone. If we look at what we've talked about recently, it would be saying, I am greater than God. My desires are greater than God. My will, my passion, my lust, my greed, my kingdom. All of it's greater than God. That's being ungodly, without worship. The second one is that they are unrestrained. They are unrestrained. He, in, in one translation that I read, it says they feel like they have a license for immorality. We can do whatever we want. The other word there, I intentionally used license for immorality, that version, because the other version says lasciviousness. How many, of, how many of you have used the word lasciviousness this week? <laughs> lasciviousness means without restraint. I mean, if you tell someone, man, I got in my car. I didn't buckle the seatbelt. I was just driving with lasciviousness. <laughs> I guess it could work, right? I don't know. Maybe it doesn't work exactly there, but it's without restraint. You know, there are restraints in life that are not there to hold us back or keep us from fun, as some would say. There are restraints in our life that are there to protect us. I mean, sometimes we feel like restraints, we always want to fight against it. I can't go where I want to go. I can't do what I want to do. It's, you're holding me back. You're holding me back. This isn't fun. Sometimes people think Christianity is like that. All of these rules, all of this restraint, I just want to, I just want to be free. And, and the restraint is there to protect us. When I was 16 years old, and I had a bad car accident. Carrie knows. I, was, I had borrowed my dad's car, too, which makes it worse. But I was driving. It was late. I flipped the car. I don't want to go into all the details, but I flipped it several times. The car was totaled. It was upside down. It was a, a Jeep Cherokee, so it had a hatch. I, I unbuckled my seatbelt, fell on my head because I was upside down, pushed the hatch, crawled out the back, just sat on the side of the road. You know, back in those days, no cell phones. Yeah. Nothing. I may have had a, a, a pager, a beeper. That does nothing for you unless someone's trying to reach you. It's like, now I need to reach someone. Ugh. One day, I'll be able to type numbers here and call someone myself. Oh. No, I didn't know. 
<laughs> but I'm just sitting there, right? When the police came, he said, the only thing that saved me was the restraint. He didn't say restraint, he said seatbelt. But you know, that's <laughs> the safety restraint. Yeah. You think about that, that in our lives. Very often, the only thing that saves us is the restraint. It wasn't there to keep me from moving. It wasn't there to keep me from feeling free. It was there to protect me. Yeah. Carrie and I both have a story of when we were young and, and our mom was ironing, Sistrika, right? Yeah. <laughs> and she had the hot, I let Strika right there. My mom did, when I was a kid and when she was a kid, we didn't know each other then, but both had the same story when our mom said, don't touch that. When our mom walked away, what did we do? It, touched <laughs> Ooh. it, it burned, right? What yeah. happens when it burns? The restraint was there to protect us. And that's what God does. He puts restraints there to protect us because without restraint, we get burned. Without restraint, we get hurt. Sometimes the restraint keeps us from hurting ourselves worse than we would get hurt in a bad situation. Yeah, I still had the car wreck. Without the restraint, I would have been dead. A lot of us still face bad situations, but without the restraint, it would be even worse. Our God is a good father. He knows what's best for us. He looks out for us. I keep thinking about that. If you, you know, so many people ignore restraint, and then they blame God when they get burned. Anyone here, you don't have to raise your hand. Or sometimes, like, <laughs> we ignore the restraint, and then it goes bad. Like, why, God? Why did you do this to me? When I've gotten burned in my life, it's always been 100% my fault. 0% God's fault. My entire life. 40-something years. It's never been God's fault. So here's these people. They're, they're ungodly. Wolves in sheep's clothing unrestrained. They, they hated God's law. Not only hated it, they twisted it and perverted it to teach something else. They perverted the grace. Peter said they were sexually immoral. Peter said they were greedy and out for themselves. They were teaching that you can do whatever you want with your body because it's your spirit that's saved. Oh, you can do whatever you want with your body. Your spirit's saved. They're teaching this in the church, perverting the grace, leading people astray. And we're being warned about it. Even Paul had said, God forbid we live like this. You know, they're saying, hey, if you sin more, there's more grace. More sin equals more grace. And Paul said, God forbid we would live like that. The third one is they were unfaithful, ungodly. They were ungodly, unrestrained, unfaithful. They pretended to follow Jesus and then tried to convince people to follow them. They were just pretenders. They twisted the truth. They had questioning spirits. Now, asking questions is okay, but a questioning spirit brings uh, destruction and it, it brings division. We see a questioning spirit even in Genesis. I was just reading that yesterday and, and added it in, thinking about this questioning spirit. When, when Adam and Eve knew what God had told them, they knew how they were supposed to live. They knew what they were supposed to do which, by the way, God had told them to be picky about what fruit they picked, which tree to go to. So I thought, wow, that really relates. Hey, pick this fruit, not that, that fruit. And then there's Satan in the form of the serpent in the tree, and he's saying, did God really say? I mean, that's a questioning spirit. He didn't really want to know. He's not looking for information. He's trying to bring doubt. And there are people with questioning spirits. Maybe you have something powerful going on in your life, or maybe God does something, and they'll just whisper this question to you, and it brings doubt. That's not from God. It's from people like this that Jude's warning us about. Satan caused even doubt in Eve by questioning. So what do we do? We're warned about these people. We're warned that they're going to try to, to, to uh, change the faith and change the message and change this gospel so if the pretender is ungodly, we should be godly. Yeah. I mean, these are really simple. The, the message is hard, but the points and what we need to do is easy. If, if, if they're ungodly, we need to be godly. Yeah. We need to be with worship. Yeah, sure. We need to place authority over us. It's God is greater than me. Yeah. There's an authority. There's a structure. 
2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Peter tells us, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. So God has given us everything we need for a godly life. And how does he say we have it? It's through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So through knowing Jesus, we receive everything we need to live this godly life. How do I live a godly life? Know Jesus. Get close to Jesus. Life group's starting soon. I've got to bring up life group because it, it's starting September 21st. We've just had a training for life group leaders and we're going to have some great groups available. One thing that will help you with life groups is surrounding yourself with some people that will help you know Jesus. If you want to, hey, I don't want to be ungodly. Pastor Chris, I don't want to be led astray. I want to, I want to know how to live godly. Surround yourself with people that are encouraging you. Hey, let's, let's live godly. Let's know Jesus. Let's know more about him. Peter also said in verse 8 of that same chapter, chapter 1 of his letter, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful. So even when we think back to the fruit, if, if we know Jesus, we can live godly and we'll be fruitful. We'll have the kind of fruit that other people can see our tree and it's healthy and they can say, hey, there's something to pick here that's going to help me. There's something that will lift me up. And skipping down from there, Galatians chapter 5 shares the fruit of the Spirit. These are some many of us know, many of us strive to live with. One of them for you may be harder than another. Everyone str struggles with a different piece of the fruit, but just as a reminder, Galatians 5 22 through 23, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And self-control leads us to the second thing. We need to be godly and we need to be restrained. We need to be restrained. I need to be restrained in my life. I'm not healthy if I'm unrestrained. We need to be restrained. The last spirit the last fruit of the Spirit, self-control, self-control. We need to have control. We need to have restraint. We don't need to be uh, people who bring shame or mockery to Jesus. I mean, if these people cause, people saw their lives and they scoffed at the gospel, they laughed. If someone observes the fruit in your life, are they going to praise Jesus or laugh at him? I mean, what if we ask ourselves that? If someone sees my life, are they going to praise Jesus or are they going to laugh at him? Oh, that's what your followers are like. That's how they live. That's what they're about. The third one is be faithful. If the wolf is unfaithful, we should be faithful. Love Jesus. Love people. Love the word of God. If we, if, to not be led astray, we need to know the word of God. Yeah. Or if someone can tell us anything and we're led astray, Psalm chapter 119, verse 97, it says, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. The law is the instruction or God's word. Man, if we just love his word and we can pray and say, God, help me to love your word. Sometimes it, it's you at home, just like me, sometimes we may feel like, man, I've just, it's just hard sometimes to find the time. It's hard to read it. Sometimes I don't understand. Or I, I, all of these things just pray and say, God, help me love your word and just start reading it. And once I started reading the Bible, even early on, I just couldn't put it down. I just started reading. I love it. I based my whole life on it. And then I added one final point for us. Be godly, be restrained, be faithful, and be watchful. Because Jude, Peter, Paul, even Jesus, what they're saying is, watch out. Watch out, be watchful, pay attention. Warren Wearsby, an author and, and a commentator of the Bible, he writes commentaries. Uh, I love some of the things he's written. He said this that's, that fits right in line with what Jude was warning. He says, the church is always one generation away from extinction. I mean, imagine that, the church is always one generation away from extinction. If our generation fails to guard the truth and entrust it to our children, then that will be the end. 
So when we're looking at what do, what do we have to fight? What do, why do we have to contend for the faith? Why do we have to do this? Because we are one generation away from extinction. If we don't defend the faith, if we don't stand on the truth, if we don't hold on to the gospel, and if we don't pass it on to our children, pass it on to the next generations, everything is lost. So let me call you like Jude called to the church. Will the real Christians please stand up? Will the real Christians please stand up? That's the title of this message. The other idea I had was you got to fight. Then I was just thinking Beastie Boys in my head. <laughs> but it is that. You got to fight. You got to stand up. Defend the unity of the church. Fight for the sanctity of our faith. Let me pray for you. Father, I'm so thankful for this warning. Lord, I'm thankful that your Holy Spirit redirected Jude. Lord, I'm sure the other letter he was going to write about the salvation we share and, and all of the wonderful things you've done, that would have been an amazing letter. But you knew there was something more important, something more powerful that the church needed. And not only for that time in, in the first century, Lord, but also for us today, you directed us to this book now. Lord, in a time where people are falling away and people are being led away uh, by false teachers and false gospels and, and this whole idea that, that once we're saved, we can live however we want. Lord, you give us this warning that we need to hang on to the faith that was given once and for all. It doesn't change. It doesn't expire. It doesn't get out of date. Everything you've already taught us is still the truth today. So Lord, help us as the real Christians to rise up and fight for that faith, to defend it, to stand on the truth. And Lord, help us to be careful and picky about who we listen to, who we take advice from, who we follow. And Lord, let us be strong enough and determined and intentional enough to continue to spread your truth to pass it down to our children, Lord, to pass it to those on the streets, Lord, that we would do just like Jude and the others did in those days. They took the word of God, they took your truth, and they spread it and changed the entire world. Lord, help us to have the strength and courage to do that today. Lord, give us the, the, the strength to fight, the will to push forward. Lord, for everyone who's at home watching today, those who may not know you yet, Lord, I pray that from this word they would be encouraged to know you, that through knowing you, Jesus, they can learn how to live a godly life. Father, you've given us everything we need to live a godly life through the knowledge of Jesus who has called us. Lord, bless your people today. Bless everyone who's here today hanging out with me. And Lord, I just pray that we would be a people who are with worship because you are number one in our life. We love you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, man, thank you guys for being here and having this little small session of church together so we could share church at home. God bless you guys. I love you. Get in a life group. Sign up this week. I'll see you next Sunday. Hey, church, what an encouraging message we had today. Thank you so much for joining us online, and we love having you as a part of our church. Before we let you go, first thing, if you made a decision today, you'd like to know more about Jesus, or if there's anything you need prayer for, we honestly love to connect with you, encourage you, and pray with you. So feel free to click on that. Our prayer team would love to pray for you. Last things, let's join our Zoom lobby hangout. Now, after your service, stop by and say hello to our IC Medan friends and family. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll be praying for you and we will see you right back here this time next week. Happy Sunday, everyone. We love you.